Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 586, Halberds and Angels. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am Will, and I have learned some interesting stuff for you today. But first, I have a voicemail for you from Tara that is important and timely because I'm recording this in the morning of Friday, April 8th, and this has to do with April 11th, 2022. All right, here's Tara. I was listening to episode 585, and I wanted to give you some knowledge. Starting April 11th, there's a big push for Etsy sellers to boycott Etsy from April 11th through the 18th, and they're asking um, buyers to do the same thing. The primary reason behind this is because Etsy is, once again, changing their fees and how much they cost. It is ridiculous how much that Etsy takes out of um, each purchase in fees. And so to help let Etsy know that, hey, we're tired of this. This is not cool. This is basically turning Etsy into the next Amazon. We don't like it. Etsy sellers are going to stop pushing their wares on April 11th. And from the 11th to the 18th, they're asking that people who usually shop on Etsy not to shop on Etsy, to boycott it for that week, to let Etsy know that, hey, we're not happy with this. This is not cool. Um, I shop a lot on Etsy, and to hear how much they're changing the prices on stuff is ridiculous. And it makes it really hard for someone like me who, yes, I want to support the small businesses, but, like, holy crap, 30%, that's a bit much, a bit much. I haven't done much research on it outside of, oh, there goes that Etsy boycott thing again. How much is it? Is it 30? Is it 60? Is it, I don't know, but it's something to look into and to share the information. Again, that's April 11th through the 18th. But to the book I go. Hope you're having a great one, Heather. Bye. Qualifying remark, I have not gone and looked into this at all but we know Tara. So there it is. I also got probably the most curious voicemail I have ever received on the Craftlet call-in line. That's area code 206-350-1642. Call and leave your own comments about Joan of Arc or whatever. But here I am going to play the 15-second curiosity call that I also received. Yeah, I hope you know and realize it is 720. You shouldn't be making these calls this early. I'd appreciate you putting that on the line. Thank you. Okay, the the part of that that just cracks me up is that I can't make outgoing calls from that number at all, even if I wanted to. I could call this guy back, though, because I do have his phone number, but I've I've decided I have better things to do with my time. Anyway. (laughs) Oh, the world is a weird place. So this week, well, two things. First, Tara, I appreciate your honesty. But I also wanted to remind you, this book is not satire. It is about as serious as the grave. And in fact, today's chapter's they're a pretty major turning point. These are the final three chapters of book one. And if you recall from our introductory chapter, this book is broken into three parts. So we are really leaving the fictionalized past of Joan in these three chapters. And you will start to notice a tone shift, a decided tone shift. And from this point out, things are pretty much in the historical record. So Twain is doing what all historical fiction does from this point out. He is fictionalizing actual history. Curiously, 
there are fewer words in this these three chapters that are kind of out of public common usage than, than there have been in previous chapters, which were fictionalized. Today, the only ones that I thought might bear refresher on is halberd or halberdiers, which are people who carry halberds. Halberds are those long poles that have on the top a pointy bit and a battle axe bit. So it looks like a jousting, stabity thing, <laughs> a very long spear. And then it, it also has the kind of gimli dwarf axe on the side. I found on Quora some really interesting descriptions. Somebody asked, how useful was this as a weapon? And the answer is really crazy useful. Charles the Brave, Duke of Burgundy, was taken down by a Swiss peasant who was wielding one of these things. So armor? Yeah, whatever. Use a halberd. I also found a video called Halberds, Why Were They That Shape? It's 22 minutes long, but it was shared out on Quora as well. And the guy who shared it said, okay, this video, I think, has the best thoughts on what a halberd could have been for. He makes some points I've never heard anywhere else. And I've watched the first, mm, maybe half of it. If you are interested in halberds, I have linked out to it in the show notes. So please feel free to learn all about weapons that are obscure today, but were ubiquitous back then. The other term that I honestly had not heard before, I must have read it and just not processed like the sound of the word, Morion, M-O-R-I-O-N. I feel kind of stupid. It's a kind of a helmet that doesn't have a beaver. It doesn't have one of those visors, the flippy up visors that in comic scenes always either flip down on you, a la Danny Kay, or squeak badly when you're flipping them up and down. So Morion were sans visor, had no visor, and were worn by soldiers in like the 16th and 17th centuries. That's it. So there's a bunch of people who are described as halberdiers with Morion, those helmets, and breastplates, which, you know, it's like an armor over your chest. Good place to have armor. That's it for language for these chapters. And honestly, that's it for pre-book talk. I'm just going to let you listen to the last three chapters of book one of Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc by Mark Twain, not a satire, <laughs> read for us by John Greenman. Here we go. Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc by Mark Twain, Chapter 6, Joan and Archangel Michael. All through her childhood, and up to the middle of her fourteenth year, Joan had been the most light-hearted creature and the merriest in the village, with a hop-skip-and-jump gait and a happy and catching laugh. And this disposition, supplemented by her warm and sympathetic nature and frank and winning ways, had made her everybody's pet. She had been a hot patriot all this time, and sometimes the war news had sobered her spirits and wrung her heart and made her acquainted with tears. But always when these interruptions had run their course, her spirits rose, and she was her old self again. But now, for a whole year and a half, she had been mainly grave, not melancholy, but given to thought, abstraction, dreams. She was carrying France upon her heart, and she found the burden not light. I knew that this was her trouble, but others attributed her abstraction to religious ecstasy, for she did not share her thinkings with the village at large, yet gave me glimpses of them, and so I knew, better than the rest, what was absorbing her interest. Many a time the idea crossed my mind that she had a secret, a secret which she was keeping wholly to herself, as well as from me as from the others. This idea had come to me because several times she had cut a sentence in two and changed the subject when apparently she was on the verge of a revelation of some sort. I was to find this secret out, but not just yet. The day after the conversation which I have been reporting, we were together in the pastures and fell to talking about France as usual. For her sake I had always talked hopefully before, but that was mere lying for really there was not anything to hang a rag of hope for France upon. Now it was such a pain to lie to her, and cost me such shame to offer this treachery to one so snow-pure from lying and treachery, 
and even from suspicion of such baseness in others as she was, that I was resolved to face about now and begin over again, and never insult her more with deception. I started on the new policy by saying, still opening up with a small lie, of course, for habit is habit, and not to be flung out of the window by any man, but coaxed downstairs a step at a time, "'Joan, I have been thinking the thing all over last night, and have concluded that we have been in the wrong all this time, that the case of France is desperate, that it has been desperate ever since Agincourt, and that today it is more than desperate, it is hopeless.' I did not look her in the face while I was saying it. It could not be expected of a person. To break her heart, to crush her hope with a so frankly brutal speech as that, without one charitable soft place in it, it seemed a shameful thing, and it was. But when it was out, the weight gone, and my conscience rising to the surface, I glanced at her face to see the result. There was none to see, at least none that I was expecting. There was a barely perceptible suggestion of wonder in her serious eyes, but that was all, and she said, in her simple and placid way, "'The case of France, hopeless? Why should you think that? Tell me.' "'It is a most pleasant thing to find that what you thought would inflict a hurt upon one whom you honour has not done it. I was relieved now, and could say all my say without any furtiveness and without embarrassment. So I began. "'Let us put sentiment and patriotic illusions aside, and look at the facts in the face.' What do they say? They say, as plainly as the figures in a merchant's account book, one has only to add the two columns up to see that the French house is bankrupt, that one half of its property is already in the English sheriff's hands, and the other half in nobody's, except those of irresponsible raiders and robbers confessing allegiance to nobody. Our king is shut up with his favorites and fools in inglorious idleness and poverty in a narrow little patch of the kingdom, a sort of back lot, as one may say, and has no authority there or anywhere else, hasn't a farthing to his name, nor a regiment of soldiers. He is not fighting, he is not intending to fight. He means to make no further resistance. In truth, there is but one thing that he is intending to do, give the whole thing up, pitch his crown into the sewer, and run away to Scotland. There are the facts. Are they correct? Yes, they are correct. Then it is as I have said, one needs but to add them together in order to realize what they mean. She asked, in an ordinary level tone, What, that the case of France is hopeless? Necessarily, in face of these facts, doubt of it is impossible. How can you say that? How can you feel like that? How can I? How could I think or feel in any other way in the circumstances? Joan, with these fatal figures before you, have you really any hope for France? Really? And actually? Hope? Oh, more than that. France will win her freedom and keep it. Do not doubt it. It seemed to me that her clear intellect must surely be clouded today. It must be so, for she would see that those figures could mean only one thing. Perhaps if I marshaled them again, she would see. So I said, Joan, your heart which worships France, is beguiling your head. You are not perceiving the importance of these figures. Here, I want to make a picture of them, here on the ground with a stick. Now, this rough outline is France. Through its middle, east and west, I draw a river. Yes, the Loire. Now then, this whole northern half of the country is in the tight grip of the English. Yes, and this whole southern half is really in nobody's hands at all, as our king confesses by meditating desertion and flight to a foreign land. England has armies here. Opposition is dead. She can assume full possession whenever she may choose. In very truth, all France is gone. France is already lost. France has ceased to exist. What was France is now but a British province. Is this true? Her voice was low, and just touched with emotion, but distinct. Yes, it is true. Very well. Now add this clinching fact, and surely the sum is complete. When have French soldiers won a victory? Scotch soldiers, under the French flag, have won a barren fight or two a few years back, but I am speaking of French ones. 
since eight thousand englishmen nearly annihilated sixty thousand frenchmen a dozen years ago at agincourt french courage has been paralyzed and so it is a common saying to-day that if you confront fifty french soldiers with five english ones the french will run it is a pity but even these things are true then certainly the day for hoping is past i believe the case would be clear to her now I thought it could not fail to be clear to her, and that she would say, herself, that there was no longer any ground for hope. But I was mistaken, and disappointed also. She said, without any doubt in her tone, "'France will rise again. You shall see.' "'Rise? With this burden of English armies on her back? She will cast it off. She will trample it underfoot. This with spirit. Without soldiers to fight with?' the drums will summon them they will answer and they will march march to the rear as usual no to the front ever to the front always to the front you shall see and the pauper king he will mount his throne he will wear his crown well of a truth this makes one's head dizzy why if i could believe that in thirty years from now the english domination would be broken and the french monarch's head find itself hooped with a real crown of sovereignty both will have happened before two years are sped indeed and who is going to perform all these sublime impossibilities god it was a reverent low note but it rang clear what could have put those strange ideas in her head this question kept running in my mind during two or three days. It was inevitable that I should think of madness. What other way was there to account for such things? Grieving and brooding over the woes of France had weakened that strong mind and filled it with fantastic phantoms. Yes, that must be it. But I watched her and tested her, and it was not so. Her eye was clear and sane. Her ways were natural. Her speech direct and to the point. No, there was nothing the matter with her mind. It was still the soundest in the village and the best. She went on thinking for others, planning for others, sacrificing herself for others, just as always before. She went on ministering to her sick and to her poor, and still stood ready to give the wayfarer her bed and content herself with the floor. There was a secret somewhere, but madness was not the key to it. This was plain." Now the key did presently come into my hands, and the way that it happened was this. You have heard all the world talk of this matter which I am about to speak of, but you have not heard an eye-witness talk of it before. I was coming over the ridge one day, it was the 15th of May, 28, and when I got to the edge of the oak forest and was about to step out of it upon the turfy open space in which the haunted beech-tree stood, I happened to cast a glance from cover first then i took a step backward and stood in the shelter and concealment of the foliage for i had caught sight of joan and thought i would devise some sort of playful surprise for her think of it that trivial conceit was neighbor with but a scarcely measurable interval of time between to an event destined to endure forever in histories and songs the day was overcast and all that grassy space wherein the tree stood lay in a soft rich shadow joan sat on a natural seat formed by gnarled great roots of the tree her hands lay loosely one reposing in the other in her lap her head was bent a little toward the ground and her air was that of one who is lost to thought steeped in dreams and not conscious of herself or of the world and now i saw a most strange thing for i saw a white shadow come slowly gliding along the grass toward the tree it was of grand proportions, a robed form with wings, and the whiteness of this shadow was not like any other whiteness that we know of, except it be the whiteness of lightnings. But even the lightnings are not so intense as it was, for one can look at them without hurt, whereas this brilliancy was so blinding that it pained my eyes and brought the water into them. I uncovered my head, perceiving that I was in the presence of something not of this world, my breath grew faint and difficult because of the terror and the awe that possessed me. Another strange thing, the wood had been silent, smitten with that deep stillness which comes when a storm-cloud darkens a forest, and the wild creatures lose heart and are afraid. 
but now all the birds burst forth into song and the joy the rapture the ecstasy of it was beyond belief and was so eloquent and so moving withal that it was plain it was an act of worship with the first note of those birds joan cast herself upon her knees and bent her head low and crossed her hands upon her breast she had not seen the shadow yet had the song of the birds told her it was coming it had that look to me then the like of this must have happened before yes there might be no doubt of that the shadow approached joan slowly the extremity of it reached her flowed over her clothed her in its awful splendor in that immortal light her face only humanly beautiful before became divine flooded with that transforming glory her mean peasant habit was become like to the raiment of the sun-clothed children of god as we see them thronging the terraces of the throne in our dreams and imaginings presently she rose and stood with her head still bowed a little and with her arms down and the ends of her fingers lightly laced together in front of her and standing so all drenched with that wonderful light and yet apparently not knowing it she seemed to listen but i heard nothing after a little she raised her head and looked up as one might look up toward the face of a giant and then clasped her hands and lifted them high imploringly and began to plead i heard some of the words i heard her say but i am so young oh so young to leave my mother and my home and go out into the strange world to undertake a thing so great ah how can i talk with men be comrade with men soldiers it would give me over to insult and rude usage and contempt how can i go to the great wars and lead armies i a girl and ignorant of such things knowing nothing of arms nor how to mount a horse nor ride it yet if it is commanded her voice sank a little and was broken by sobs and i made out no more of her words then i came to myself i reflected that i had been intruding upon a mystery of god and what might my punishment be i was afraid and went deeper into the wood then i carved a mark in the bark of a tree saying to myself it may be that i am dreaming and have not seen this vision at all i will come again when i know that i am awake and not dreaming and see if this mark is still here then i shall know end of chapter six personal recollections of joan of arc by mark twain chapter seven she delivers the divine command i heard my name called it was joan's voice it startled me for how could she know i was there i said to myself it is part of the dream it is all dream voice vision and all the fairies have done this so i crossed myself and pronounced the name of god to break the enchantment i knew i was awake now and free from the spell for no spell can withstand this exorcism then i heard my name called again and i stepped at once from under cover and there indeed was joan but not looking as she had looked in the dream for she was not crying now but was looking as she had used to look a year and a half before when her heart was light and her spirits high her old-time energy and fire were back and a something like exaltation showed itself in her face and bearing it was almost as if she had been in a trance all that time and had come awake again really it was just as if she had been away and lost and was come back to us at last and i was so glad that i felt like running to call everybody and have them flock around her and give her welcome i ran to her excited and said ah joan i've got such a wonderful thing to tell you about you would never imagine it i've had a dream and in the dream i saw you right here where you are standing now and but she put up her hand and said it was not a dream it gave me a shock and i began to feel afraid again not a dream i said how can you know about it joan are you dreaming now i i suppose not i, I think i am not indeed you are not i know you are not and you were not dreaming when you cut the mark in the tree i felt myself turning cold with fright for now i knew of a certainty that i had not been dreaming but had really been in the presence of a dread something not of this world then i remembered that my sinful feet were upon holy ground the ground where that celestial shadow had rested i moved quickly away smitten to the bones with fear joan followed and said do not be afraid 
indeed there is no need come with me we will sit by the spring and i will tell you all my secret when she was ready to begin i checked her and said first tell me this you could not see me in the wood how did you know i cut a mark in the tree wait a little i will soon come to that then you will see but tell me one thing now what was that awful shadow that i saw i will tell you but do not be disturbed you are not in danger it was the shadow of an archangel michael the chief and lord of the armies of heaven i could but cross myself and tremble for having polluted that ground with my feet you were not afraid joan did you see his face did you see his form yes i was not afraid because this was not the first time i was afraid the first time when was that joan it is nearly three years ago now so long have you seen him many times yes many times it is this then that has changed you it was this that made you thoughtful and not as you were before i see it now why did you not tell us about it it was not permitted it is permitted now and soon i shall tell all but only you now it must remain a secret for a few days still has none seen that white shadow before but me no one it has fallen upon me before when you and others were present but none could see it to-day it has been otherwise and i was told why but it will not be visible again to any it was a sign to me then and a sign with a meaning of some kind yes but i may not speak of that strange that that dazzling light could rest upon an object before one's eyes and not be visible with it comes speech also several saints come attended by myriads of angels and they speak to me i hear their voices but others do not they are very dear to me my voices that is what i call them to myself joan what do they tell you all manner of things about france i mean what things have they been used to tell you she sighed and said disasters only disasters and misfortunes and humiliation there was naught else to foretell they spoke of them to you beforehand yes so that i knew what was going to happen before it happened it made me grave as you saw it could not be otherwise but always there was a word of hope too more than that france was to be rescued and made great and free again but how and by whom uh, that was not told not until to-day as she said those last words a sudden deep glow shone in her eyes which i was to see there many times in after days when the bugle sounded the charge and learned to call it the battle light her breast heaved and the color rose in her face but to-day i know god has chosen the meanest of his creatures for this work and by his command and in his protection and by his strength not mine i am to lead his armies and win back france and set the crown upon the head of his servant that is dauphin and shall be king i was amazed and said you joan you a child lead armies yes for one little moment or two the thought crushed me for it is as you say i am only a child a child and ignorant ignorant of everything that pertains to war and not fitted for the rough life of camps and the companionship of soldiers but those weak moments passed they will not come again i am enlisted i will not turn back god helping me till the english grip is loosed from the throat of france my voices have never told me lies they have not lied to-day they say i'm to go to robert de baudricourt governor of vaucouleurs and he will give me men-at-arms for escort and send me to the king a year from now a blow will be struck which will be the beginning of the end and the end will follow swiftly where will it be struck my voices have not said nor what will happen this present year before it is struck it is appointed me to strike it that is all i know and follow it with others sharp and swift undoing in ten weeks england's long years of costly labor and setting the crown upon the dauphin's head for such is god's will my voices have said it and shall i doubt it 
no it will be as they have said for they say only that which is true these were tremendous sayings they were impossibilities to my reason but to my heart they rang true and so while my reason doubted my heart believed believed and held fast to the belief from that day presently i said joan i believe the things which you have said and now i am glad that i am to march with you to the great wars that is if it is with you i am to march when i go she looked surprised and said it is true that you will be with me when i go to the wars but how did you know i shall march with you and so also will jean and pierre but not jacques all true it is so ordered as was revealed to me lately but i did not know until to-day that the marching would be with me or that i should march at all how did you know these things i told her when it was that she had said them but she did not remember about it so then i knew that she had been asleep or in a trance or an ecstasy of some kind at that time she bade me keep these and other revelations to myself for the present and i said i would and kept the faith i promised none who met joan that day failed to notice the change that had come over her she moved and spoke with energy and decision there was a strange new fire in her eye and also a something wholly new and remarkable in her carriage and in the set of her head this new light in the eye and this new bearing were born of the authority and leadership which had this day been vested in her by the decree of god and they asserted that authority as plainly as speech could have done it yet without ostentation or bravado this calm consciousness of command and calm unconscious outward expression of it remained with her thenceforth until her mission was accomplished like the other villagers she had always accorded me the deference due my rank but now without word said on either side she and i changed places she gave orders not suggestions i received them with the deference due a superior and obeyed them without comment in the evening she said to me i leave before dawn no one will know it but you i go to speak with the governor of vaucouleurs as commanded who will despise me and treat me rudely and perhaps refuse my prayer at this time i go first to buret to persuade my uncle laxart to go with me it not being meet that i go alone i may need you in vaucouleurs for if the governor will not receive me i will dictate a letter to him and so must have some one by me who knows the art of how to write and spell the words you will go from here to-morrow in the afternoon and remain in vaucouleurs until i need you i said i would obey and she went her way you see how clear a head she had and what a just and level judgment she did not order me to go with her no she would not subject her good name to gossiping remark she knew that the governor being a noble would grant me another noble audience but no you see she would not have that either a poor peasant girl presenting a petition through a young nobleman how would that look she always protected her modesty from hurt and so for reward she carried her good name unsmirched to the end i knew what i must do now if i would have her approval go to vaucouleurs keep out of her sight and be ready when wanted i went the next afternoon and took an obscure lodging the next day i called at the castle and paid my respects to the governor who invited me to dine with him at noon of the following day he was an ideal soldier of the time tall brawny gray-headed rough full of strange oaths acquired here and there and yonder in the wars and treasured as if they were decorations he had been used to the camp all his life and to his notion war was god's best gift to man he had his steel cuirass on and wore boots that came above his knees and was equipped with a huge sword and when i looked at this martial figure and heard the marvellous oaths and guessed how little of poetry and sentiment might be looked for in this quarter i hoped the little peasant girl would not get the privilege of confronting this battery but would have to content herself with the dictated letter i came again to the castle the next day at noon and was conducted to the great dining-hall and seated by the side of the governor at a small table which was raised a couple of steps higher than the general table at the small table sat several other guests besides myself and at the general table sat the chief officers of the garrison at the entrance door stood a guard of halberdiers in morion and breastplate as for talk there was but one topic of course the desperate situation of france 
There was a rumor, someone said, that Salisbury was making preparations to march against Orleans. It raised a turmoil of excited conversation, and opinions fell thick and fast. Some believed he would march at once, others that he could not accomplish the investment before fall, others that the siege would be long and bravely contested. But upon one thing all voices agreed, that Orléans must eventually fall, and with it France. With that the prolonged discussion ended, and there was silence. Every man seemed to sink himself in his own thoughts, and to forget where he was. This sudden and profound stillness, where before had been so much animation, was impressive and solemn. Now came a servant, and whispered something to the governor, who said, "'Would talk with me?' "'Yes, Your Excellency.' "'Hm. A strange idea, certainly. Uh, bring them in.' It was Joan and her uncle Laxart. At the spectacle of the great people, the courage oozed out of the poor old peasant, and he stopped midway and would come no further, but remained there with his red nightcap crushed in his hands, and bowing humbly here, there, and everywhere, stupefied with embarrassment and fear. But Joan came steadily forward, erect and self-possessed, and stood before the governor. She recognized me, but in no way indicated it. There was a buzz of admiration, even the governor contributing to it, for I heard him mutter, "'By God's grace, it is a beautiful creature!' He inspected her critically a moment or two, and then said, "'Well, what is your errand, my child?' "'My message is to you, Robert de Baudricot, governor of Vaucouleurs, and it is this, that you will send and tell the Dauphin to wait and not give battle to his enemies, for God will presently send him help.' This strange speech amazed the company, and many murmured, "'The poor young thing is demented.' The governor scowled and said, "'What nonsense is this? The king, or, or the dauphin, as you call him, needs no message of that sort. He will wait. Give yourself no uneasiness as to that. What further do you desire to say to me?' "'This, to beg that you will give me an escort of men-at-arms, and send me to the dauphin.' "'What for?' that he may make me his general, for it is appointed that I shall drive the English out of France and set the crown upon his head. What? You? Why, you are but a child. Yet am I appointed to do it nevertheless. Indeed. And when will all this happen? Next year he will be crowned, and after that will remain master of France." There was a great and general burst of laughter, and when it had subsided the governor said, "'Who has sent you with these extravagant messages?' "'My lord.' "'What lord?' "'The king of heaven.' Many murmured, "'Ah, poor thing, poor thing!' And others, "'Ah, her mind is but a wreck!' The governor hailed Laxart and said, "'Hark ye! Take this mad child home and whip her soundly. That is the best cure for her ailment.' As Joan was moving away, she turned and said with simplicity, "'You refuse me, the soldiers, I know not why, for it is my lord that has commanded you. Yes, it is he that has made the command. Therefore I must come again, and yet again. Then I shall have the men-at-arms.' There was a great deal of wondering talk after she was gone, and the guards and servants passed the talk to the town. The town passed it to the country." Tom Remy was already buzzing with it when we got back. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc by Mark Twain Why the Scorners Relented Human nature is the same everywhere. It defies success. It has nothing but scorn for defeat. The village considered that Joan had disgraced it with her grotesque performance and its ridiculous failure. So all the tongues were busy with the matter, and as bilious and bitter as they were busy, insomuch that if the tongues had been teeth, she would not have survived her persecutions. Those persons who did not scold did what was worse and harder to bear, for they ridiculed her and mocked at her, and ceased neither day nor night from their witticisms and jeerings and laughter. Homet and little Mangette and I stood by her, but the storm was too strong for her other friends, and they avoided her, being ashamed to be seen with her because she was so unpopular, and because of the sting of the taunts that assailed them on her account. 
she shed tears in secret but none in public in public she carried herself with serenity and showed no distress nor any resentment conduct which should have softened the feeling against her but it did not her father was so incensed that he could not talk in measured terms about her wild project of going to the wars like a man he had dreamed of her doing such a thing some time before and now he remembered that dream with apprehension and anger and said that rather than see her unsex herself and go away with the armies he would require her brothers to drown her and that if they should refuse he would do it with his own hands but none of these things shook her purpose in the least her parents kept a strict watch upon her to keep her from leaving the village but she said her time was not yet that when the time to go was come she should know it and then the keepers would watch in vain the summer wasted along and when it was seen that her purpose continued steadfast the parents were glad of a chance which finally offered itself for bringing her projects to an end through marriage the paladin had the effrontery to pretend that she had engaged herself to him several years before and now he claimed a ratification of the engagement she said his statement was not true and refused to marry him she was cited to appear before the ecclesiastical court at toul to answer for her perversity when she declined to have counsel and elected to conduct her case herself her parents and all her ill-wishers rejoiced and looked upon her as already defeated and that was natural enough for who would expect that an ignorant peasant girl of sixteen would be otherwise than frightened and tongue-tied when standing for the first time in presence of the practised doctors of the law and surrounded by the cold solemnities of a court yet all these people were mistaken they flocked to toul to see and enjoy this fright and embarrassment and defeat and they had their trouble for their pains she was modest tranquil and quite at her ease she called no witnesses saying she would content herself with examining the witnesses for the prosecution when they had testified she rose and reviewed their testimony in a few words pronounced it vague confused and of no force then she placed the paladin again on the stand and began to search him his previous testimony went rag by rag to ruin under her ingenious hands until at last he stood bare so to speak he that had come so richly clothed in fraud and falsehood his counsel began an argument but the court declined to hear it and threw out the case adding a few words of grave compliment for joan and referring to her as this marvellous child after this victory with this high praise from so imposing a source added the fickle village turned again and gave joan countenance compliment and peace her mother took her back to her heart and even her father relented and said he was proud of her but the time hung heavy on her hands nevertheless for the siege of orleans was begun the clouds lowered darker and darker over france and still her voices said wait and gave her no direct commands the winter set in and wore tediously along but at last there was a change end of chapter eight and of book one Right. So, major turning point. I know, because now not only has Joan confessed, I guess, to having spoken to her angels for a while now, but Louis has also seen them, which is, well, seen, seen one of them, seen Michael. Now, we haven't been told who the other ones are yet, but one of the women that I work with these days is Catholic, and she's very active in her parish. And I asked her about these three angels that visited Joan of Arc. She said, a couple of years ago, her parish started praying to St. Michael after every Mass. Here is the official St. Michael prayer at her parish. It's St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. For Joan, it is particularly important that the first angel who makes contact with her, and the one who she's spoken to for the longest, is Michael. Michael is often depicted in classical art, you know, oil paintings and things like that, as standing one foot on a dragon or Satan. 
armed for battle. He is a strategic thinker. He is a fearsome warrior. He is a defender of good and holy and God. There's some other subtle stuff that goes on, which we'll deal with later. But one of the things about Joan and having these angels come to her is that she really does, and this is the beginning of it, start to know things she has no actual way she could know. And this is where the story leaves everyday life and starts to become really quite curious. So I'm, I'm going to let you ponder on that. And I'm going to start preparing for next week because once we start book two, stuff gets real is what it comes down to. All right. Tara, I hope you enjoyed these chapters. <laughs> and I hope you enjoyed both the chapters and the strangest voicemail I have ever received. Again, if you wanted to call in and leave your own real comments, 206-350-1642. And next week, I am also going to start going over with you guys the Ireland tour coming up this October. I feel like adding come hell or high water, but I know that's not true. It was neither hell nor high water that prevented us from going when we had originally planned. But because Ireland has reopened and there's a little bit more flexibility, we do have spaces available. And as Diane has more information on how we will be traveling, like whether Ireland still has mask mandates in the fall or whatever. That will all be conveyed to you as we learn it, because we are learning it from Ireland as well. All right, you have a great week. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what you hear on Craftlit, please review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, join in the fun in our Facebook group, which is Craftlit Annotated Audiobooks. Always the nicest group of people you're going to find on Facebook and the place where you can come to and say, nobody else was going to understand this, but I knew you all would. And of course, thank you for your support of Craftlit. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>